Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for being here. It's been a couple of weeks since we had a press conference, and quite a bit has happened in the meantime. So before we focus on the topic at hand, I thought I'd reflect a bit on last week's elections. First of all, I want to thank Vermonters for again putting their trust in me. And I also want to thank Esther for running. But I think the most important uh, election results came from legislative races, where Vermonters had their pocketbooks in mind when they overwhelmingly voted for change and more balance because they can no longer afford the direction the majority had set. They want lawmakers to focus on the needs of all working families because so many are struggling to get by and are worried about their financial future. So even though Democrats still have a clear majority in the House and Senate, I'm pleased to see more moderate legislators coming to Montpelier. I believe this will mean the majority party will need to listen just to me just a little bit more, to my team just a little bit more, and to everyday Vermonters. And just as I have for the last eight years, I'll continue to bring the voice of all Vermonters to the State House and hope legislators will put politics aside and do what's best for their communities. I also know the results of the national election raises concerns and uncertainty for many because we don't know what President Trump will do. But here's what I do know. He won a fair election. And in the end, it wasn't close. And we have to respect the will of the voters. So for the sake of our country, we need to tamp down the division and fear. And we need to at least give him the opportunity to do better and do the right thing. And like I did in my uh, first term, I, um, I won't hesitate to protect Vermonters and our rights if that becomes necessary. But if those of us who didn't vote for him immediately go into attack mode, that's only going to further divide us. And we desperately need to heal our fractured country. We need to set the example, come together, and listen to one another. Now to the topic at hand. Last week, we learned that for the July 2023 storm, the federal funding share will now be 90% instead of 75%. This happens when FEMA's obligations exceed a per capita impact threshold, which for that storm was 111.3 million. Having hit that mark, we now get 90% reimbursement from the federal government. That's good news for towns impacted by the July 2023 storm. I want to thank General Roy, FEMA leadership, and the White House for its support. In total, this change will bring us tens of millions more in public assistance over the course of this recovery. Again, I want to reiterate, this was for 2023, not 2024. And before I turn it over to General Roy to talk a little more about what this means, I want to remind those who were impacted this year that the deadline to, to apply for FEMA is November 25th. That deadline is for both the July 9 to 11 storm and the July 29 to 30 storm. And here's the important part. If your home or property was damaged in both of these storms, you need to apply for both separately. We believe there may still be some impacted by the late July storms who have not applied, and your window is closing. So please make sure you do. It's also important to note that applying to FEMA is different than reporting your damage to 211. So if you just reported your damage to 211 for one or both storms, you need to apply to FEMA by November 25th. So with that, I'll turn it over to General Roy. Okay. Thank you, Governor Scott. And again, congratulations, sir. 
Although we're currently working uh, seven disasters uh, in our field office in Vermont, the flooding that uh, took place in July 2023 is the largest and most expensive disaster on record since Tropical Storm Irene. We manage three primary programs in the Joint Field Office, individual assistance, housing mitigation, and public assistance. Specifically for the July 23 declaration, which is titled DR 4720, the individual assistance portion of this disaster resulted in close to $40 million of assistance to individuals and families directly impacted by the storm. We also conducted the very first direct housing mission in New England, which provided assistance in the form of mobile homes and rental properties for the most severely impacted survivors. FEMA's Hazard Mitigation Grant Program provides additional funding to the state to use where it believes it has the greatest impact based upon the estimated amount of this disaster. Vermont uh, has access to roughly uh, $80 million to support the mitigation efforts throughout the state, including funds for the Vermont Emergency Management uh, Agency to support state and local buyout programs. Vermont's public assistance program is the largest of the three programs, and based upon the size and scope of the July 2023 storms, 195 communities and state entities are applicants in this disaster, which has an estimated cost in excess of $600 million. As of this date, 90% of the total of the 1,507 projects have been processed, and well over half have received their reimbursement from FEMA. The majority of the rest are almost complete, and we expect all of the communities to, be, to close out their projects just after the new year. For DR 4720 only, as Governor Scott stated, based on the cost of this disaster, Vermont qualified for an increase in the cost share from the standard 75% federal to 25% state to the greater amount of 90% federal and 10% state. These changes will take place automatically. For those funds already dispersed, FEMA will provide additional 15% to the state to provide to the communities. Any projects that are currently being worked will be funded at the 90% federal share. Again, this is only for the impacts from the summer 2023 storm, DR4720. As I noted earlier, Vermont currently has seven major disaster declarations we're supporting in our joint field office. I'd like to do a short recap on the other six major dis disaster declarations we're working. DR 4744 was declared for public assistance in Addison County on October 4th of last year. There are 11 applicants for that disaster, which is estimated to cost about $5 million uh, and, uh, for the storm that occur occurred on August 20th third of 2023. Of the 11 applicants, all but two have received their full grant funding. For DR 4762, it was declared for public assistance in March of this year for the impacts from which occurred on last December. There are 28 applicants for this disaster. Of those, 18 are 100% completed in the grant funding, uh, and the rest will be completed by mid-December. The, the cost estimate for this disaster is around $8 million. For DR 4770, uh, it was declared for public assistance in April of this year, and that's due to the impacts from the January of 2024 storm, and there are nine applicants, of which only two have remaining work. All the rest have been fully funded. The disaster es uh, estimate for this is approximately $3 million. DR 4810 was declared this past August for the July 9-10 storm for both public assistance and individual assistance. There are 96 applicants for public assistance for this disaster, many of whom were in the July 2023 storm. We are in the process of meeting with those applicants to go over their impact for public assistance. The deadline for individual assistance for that disaster uh, for individuals and families is coming on the 25th of November. For those who have applied, our specialists continue to reach out to them, following up with them to make sure all their eligible needs are met. As a result of that outreach, an additional $1.3 million has been provided to applicants, contributing to the $8.3 million so far. DR4816 was declared in September for public assistance for the storms from the June storm for one county, Lamoille. There are three applicants for that disaster, and the cost, cost estimate is approximately $2 million.
And the last disaster is DER 4826, which was declared in September as a result of the damage from the late July storm in the Northeast Kingdom. Both individual and public assistance have been authorized. So far, over $1.2 million has been approved for individual assistance, and the deadline for applying for that declaration is also November 25th. Disaster recovery centers are currently open to support anyone who was impacted by both July storms this past summer. If you'd like to apply for assistance in person or have questions about your application, please visit one of our disaster recovery centers. We currently have two open, both, and both will close permanently on Saturday, November 23rd. There's one in Linden uh, at 316 Main Street, and the other is in Hinesburg at 10632 Route 16, uh, 116. And their hours of operation are 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. daily, uh, Saturday, uh, Monday through Saturday. If you have not yet applied, you can do so through online disasterassistance.gov, download the FEMA mobile app, call FEMA's helpline at 1-800-621-3362, or visit one of our DRCs. Thank you for the opportunity to brief you on FEMA's operations of Vermont. I'll be followed by Commissioner Fisco. Yeah. Thank you, General. <clears throat> Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Danielle Fitzko. I'm the Commissioner of the Department of Forest, Parks, and Recreation, and I'm going to give you an update on Vermont's wildland fire situation. Wildland fire danger rating remains high in parts of Vermont. That rating is an indication of how likely wildfires will ignite, spread, and become challenging to control. Our rating system goes from low to extreme, and when we have a high level, it means conditions are favorable for fires, increased caution is needed, and preparedness levels are elevated. Due to the current conditions, there is a debris burning ban in effect for four Vermont counties in the south, Bennington, Rutland, Wyndham, and Windsor. That means no urban open burning permits will be issued by your local forest fire warden. Regardless of your location in Vermont, we discourage any open outdoor debris burning at this time until there is snow on the ground or significant rainfall. I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview of what's going on with the weather that's contributing to this situation. Approximately two-thirds of Vermont is in a drought classification. While northern areas were excessively wet this past summer, southern areas missed most of the precipitation. These drought conditions combined with above average temperatures has led to very dry fuels. This includes an abundance of dead leaves and grass, as well as heavier forest fuels, such as dead trees and limbs that are normally wet this time of year. Once fire spreads to these heavier fuels, they are far more difficult to extinguish. It's important to know that conditions change daily with winds and precipitation. However, wildfire risk will remain above average until we get significant rain or snow. Southern areas of Vermont will need at least three to four inches of liquid precipitation to increase moisture in the soil and larger fuels. Weather conditions determine how dry fuels are and how quickly fire spreads. And seasons vary from year to year and from place to place. While Vermont has seen similar conditions in the past, climate change may be con contributing to the frequency of these events. We want to make sure Vermonters are fire aware, following any burn bans and being very careful with any open flames or heat sources. This includes disposal of wood stove ash. Several recent fires have been caused by proper, improper disposal of ashes. It should be noted that most wildland fires in Vermont are human caused. Please be fire aware during this heightened risk. And note that local conditions vary. Always contact your town forest fire warden to obtain a permit to burn debris. Even in northern areas where Vermont does not have a burn ban, many local fire wardens have local burn bans in place. The De Department of Forest Parks and Re uh, Recreation's wildland fire team and local fire departments across the state are monitoring weather and fire risk and will do our best to respond to any fire starts. 
recent rapid responses in fires for fires in Brattleboro, Barnard, Ludlow, Huntington, Essex, and many more over the past few weeks have limited the spread of these fires and kept damage to a minimum. Other states in the region are dealing with similar issues, noting many fires in New York, Massachusetts, Connecticut, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania. The fires in these states brought some noticeable smoke to our area over the weekend. Vermont is also part of the Northeast Forest Fire Compact and has agreements in place to request assistance when needed. We recently had a call in assistance for a 58-acre fire in Barnard, and we received assistance for, from the Green Mountain National Forest and the state of New Hampshire. To learn more about wildland fire risk for your town, visit the department's website to see current conditions at fpr.vermont.gov backslash wildfire slash situations. As always, thanks to the first responders and teams for responding to these fires. I guess I'll pass it back. All right. Thank you, Danny. Um, maybe we could, it's not lost on me that we're talking about floods and drought in the same press conference, but uh, it is where we are uh, at this point in time. Um, maybe we'll start with uh, on topic first and then go on to others so we can excuse some who don't want to be part of this. Um, Will, can you talk about what specifically triggered it's changed from 75 to 90 for municipalities? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, as the governor had mentioned, there's a metric that uh, is used uh, by FEMA. Uh, I think it's $173 per uh, per dollar. It's $1.73 uh, per, per uh, person, uh, which for Vermont equated to $111,321,251 uh, for total cost of federal uh, expenditures. So, uh, you know, so the 75% Got us all got it to that amount, and then uh, and then it kicked in the, the process for the 90-10 cost year, uh, and it's a way of helping states and territories and tribes uh, who are overwhelmed by a very large disaster. So clearly, the smaller ones, eight, ten, twenty million dollars, the state is able to uh, recover from. When it gets to that large uh, of an expenditure per capita. Um, it's understood that there's initial help needed, and that's a, uh, an avenue that Congress has given us to help states, tribes, and, and territories. And is it per capita based on uh, population and ca declared counties or population statewide? Uh, it's a statewide population, because not all, all, all counties were declared for public assistance in, in 4720. Ballpark, do you know how much more money is going to be going to municipalities as a result of this? Um, so uh, there's a couple different estimates that are out there. Uh, as I started, made it, as I noted in my uh, comments, uh, roughly about 600 million dollars. Uh, it really depends on uh, the total repair replacement costs associated with uh, the the impacts. Uh, buildings and general services obviously one of our biggest uh, applicants because of the impacts in Montpelier. Uh, so, and that's going to be years down the road before we determine the total cost, much like in Irene uh, uh, for the, the Waterbury complex. Um, sorry if I'm being dense. I thought the state got an 80 20 share. Am I wrong about that? 75 fit, 25 for the. It was, uh, so there was an adjustment for the hazard mitigation uh, program. Uh, associated with public assistance, if you do certain things, you get 80 percent versus a 75 percent. Uh, and uh, but to your point as well, early on, uh, the president had approved 100 percent cost share for certain categories of work, uh, debris removal and emergency protective measures specifically. And was there a date certain when it was determined that we had achieved this threshold? But we were just about there when, unfortunately, due to lack of funds, uh, we had to stop the public assistance and, and went into immediate needs funding. Um, and then as soon as that was raised, uh, within a week, we had achieved the, the 90 10 cost year. So that, that's like late last week? Uh, it was uh, in uh, late September, I believe it was. And it took a while for yes. Congress. Yes. Yes. Uh, right. Yeah. Uh, so we thank you, Governor. Why are we hearing about this yeah. right now? Like, when did we? That, that is a great question. Thank you, Governor, for picking that. So we, we met the threshold uh, then, but it takes uh, approval from the president to make the uh, fit the adjustment to the cost year, and it's amendment to the actual disaster. Thank it, you, Governor. And he just did that last yes. week. Yes. Last yeah. week. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. 
Thank you. Sorry. Thank you, Governor. <coughs> Okay. Thank you, sir. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Governor, uh, right off the top, you mentioned last Tuesday voters' concerns about affordability, et cetera. Part of that was concerns about what a potential clean heat standard could bring. Um, we don't know what it's going to look like or how the legislature is going to vote, but if we don't have a clean heat standard, what, what do you see the conversation looking like in meeting the requirements of the Global Warming Solutions Act? Well, there's a lot to what you're just asking. Um, first of all, we have to wait and see what is presented to the legislature at that point. Uh, that's in the law uh, that was passed. <clears throat> um, and as you remember, I vetoed that and was overridden. So that'll come back to the legislature. The legislature still the um, Democrats still have the majority, uh, so they can do what they want at that point. Um, but we'll have to, to see. I believe there needs, and again, another act that, um, that I vetoed and was overridden on was the Global Warming Solutions Act. I believe that there needs to be some adjustments there. I, I don't believe the, uh, the dates are attainable. Uh, I think there are some um, amongst, amongst many uh, that uh, believe the same. And I think other states are going to struggle with some of the same dates and requirements. So we'll, uh, we'll have to have that conversation uh, after the legislature is organized. What do you think the, the policy, or I guess how would you make that, that pitch to your, your uh, to Democrats really saying we should reevaluate the timeline, the benchmarks? I mean, how, how would you make that, that pitch to them? Well, I mean, you have to be realistic, right? I mean, I think it's just, I think if anything, uh, this, this last election, I think constituents, Vermonters were saying, you got to use some common sense here. We can't do this all at once. We're going to have to, to do this uh, over time. And don't keep punishing us uh, for when we're trying to do the right thing. So we believe, I believe, uh, that there's a path forward. Uh, we still want to, to uh, make sure that we're doing all we can uh, to mitigate climate change, uh, which is something that I truly believe in. Uh, but at the same time, there's a pace uh, that I think we have to accept, that we can't do all of this at once. And that's, it felt like we did a lot of that over the last couple of years. We exceeded uh, the pace that Vermonters could afford. How does this conversation fit in with the fact that Trump has now won re-election and is so clearly talking about pulling back some of the federal efforts to mitigate climate change and he's talking about pulling out of the Paris Climate Accords again? Again, we'll see. I mean, there's a lot of talk about a lot of things that he will do or not do, and uh, we've seen a lot of the rhetoric uh, throughout the campaign, but that's typically what happens during a campaign, and then we have to wait and see what, what really does happen. We'll continue to do our part uh, here in Vermont, um, ex pulling our share uh, in some respects, and, uh, and we'll, because climate change is real, and we have to do something about it, both as a country and as states. So we'll continue to do our part, but, uh, but again, at a pace we can afford. In 2017, based on campaign rhetoric, you had heard from Trump. Then um, you signed legislation that prohibited state and local law enforcement agencies from entering into 287G agreements without your authorization. I'm wondering, based on the campaign rhetoric you've heard this time around, what you have in mind in terms of preemptive measures to safeguard residents who would be at threat of deportation due to their immigration status? Well, again, I think we're going to have to wait and see what, again, there's a lot of rhetoric out there, um, and what can effectively be done and what can't. I think the vast majority of Americans, and, and I believe as well, we need to protect our border. Um, we've been kicking this can down the road, both parties, for decades and have done nothing about legal immigration reform. And that's what's needed. And, uh, and they came close just a few months ago. And um, if not for, I think, President-elect Trump uh, intervening, I think we would have had something that would have been helpful. 
But having said that, that didn't happen. Uh, so hopefully they'll move forward. This Congress, uh, along with the president, uh, will move forward with something similar because I thought that was workable. It was acceptable uh, by both parties. But we have to we have to do something. And uh, and even President Obama recognized that when he was in office. I mean he um, there was. 400,000, I think, deportations every year <coughs> under his watch. And that was over a three-year period. So there was over a million people deported. Um, so it's not as though this is unreasonable to say that we need to do something about those who are here illegally. It's just how we do it. And, uh, and again, at at who, who is it? And, and is there a path forward for them to be here? And I think that that's something the Congress has to act on almost immediately in, in tandem with what the president does or doesn't do. I mean, the president has talked about deporting all 17 million people who are in the country. Right I, th I think right that's now. just unrealistic. Um, I, ju I just don't see how that could happen. Well, if you're a migrant farm worker in Enosburg, it, it feels pretty real. Yeah. Um, and so there are representatives of those communities that want to know what are our state leaders, including the governor, going to do to keep us safe from that outcome? Well, again, we proved um, before um, that we would take whatever action we needed to to protect Vermonters and some of those folks who are here um, that that we need to have as part of our communities. Uh, but we didn't react um, until I came into office. It was into January. We knew more about what the plan was at that point in time by the president. And I'm not sure um, that we know completely what his plan is because I, I don't see that what he has proposed is realistic. And I... I would have to think that those who are coming into power with him would understand that. Have you talked to Governor Pritzker about the organization that he's forming? No. Have you heard about it? Yeah. I just heard about it yesterday. What do you think? Um, you know, I don't think there's a single governor uh, in office today that doesn't want to protect democracy. Um, I would. I don't know much about the organization. I don't know who's leading it. I think Governor Pritzker is one. Governor Newsom might be another. I don't know if you've connected the dots, but I think they're running in 2028, right? So I think, as I said before, we, we have to take the politics out of this. And we have to work together in some way to get through this. So adding insult to injury, to, to jump on board something that we all want to protect anyhow, I think it further divides us. Like, I don't see that this is going to help us in any way. But if, you know, if, uh, down the road, if, if we see that there, this, is, this is needed and it would be helpful and so forth, you know, I'll readdress it. But at this point in time, I'm not, I'm not ready to jump on this. It's, it feels too political to me. How do you make that calculation, though, of when is the right time? Because if there is a credible threat, you know, you don't want to wait too long. Right. Well, again, we have to wait and see what it is uh, that's being presented and then deal with it from there. I, I think we're getting ahead of ourselves, but, um, but time will tell. So you don't think that the, the promises that Trump has made on the campaign trail, it, it sounds like you don't think a lot of them are going to fully come to fruition? I think that... Um, they will address some of them, most of them, maybe, in some form, um, but not to the magnitude that he, he uh, committed to on the campaign trail. No, I don't, I don't believe. Governor, but we'll see. Oh, sorry. There, there was some reporting this week about an update on the cost of those family shelters that DCF stood up, something to the tune of $3 million. I'm wondering if you can maybe shed some light on where those those costs have, have come from and you know from from you from DCF I mean how are we measuring success of this program would you yeah. say um, first of all uh, I'm I wasn't I wasn't aware of the 3.1 million dollars I don't know the details of that uh, whether that's projected over a certain period of time uh, I know we stood these emergency shelters up quickly 
and I don't know what other emergency shelters it might incorporate. So um, we'll, we'll look into that and, and see, uh, because we put both of these uh, emergency shelters, family shelters uh, that we set up are in state buildings. Uh, we are using some state staff, um, but, uh, but we struggle uh, to find a partner in both of those uh, entities. Uh, well, one in particular, Williston, uh, we didn't have a designated agency that was willing to step up and, and help us out. So we're using um, the resources that we have, uh, as well as having to hire like a traveling type of uh, uh, person, people to oversee this. So again, um, how do you measure success? Here's what, here's my feeling uh, about the, I think the hotel motel program uh, was a failure. I think it cost too much money, and it was just housing people, and it didn't help them um, in the long run. So there were people who might have lived in the hotel motel program for four years, and I don't believe that that was successful because I don't think they were able to move out of the situation they found themselves in. I think this program that we're putting together, and we'll learn a lot from it, we want to help them. We want to help them get to a point where they have housing themselves. We want to help them find employment if that's a barrier. We want to help them with whatever issues they might have, whether it's addiction or whatever the issue is, and help them succeed. And we couldn't do that in the hotel motel program because they were a warehouse there and they wouldn't have to let us in. We didn't, we didn't know what they were doing, what their problems were. We were just paying the bills. This way, we are able to connect with them. And I will say, I, I want to give, again, credit where credit's due, uh, the, the town of Waterbury, a village of Waterbury, and uh, the town of Williston uh, have been terrific partners in wanting to help. And the community is rallying behind uh, that effort. And I think that says a lot about Vermont and the way we can do things, because if we're all willing to come together as a community to help those who need our help. Um, that's what makes it, that's, that's, that's a responsible thing to do. And I think that in the long run, this will be a success as a result. So maybe depending on what we see, if I'm hearing you correctly, depending on what we see here, you may be more comfortable or, or more willing to put in state dollars, either in the budget or budget adjustment, something going forward, if you see this program or this model that, that the state is, is developing here pay off? Well, again, I just want to remind everybody, I, don't, I didn't think the hotel motel program uh, was effective. It wasn't cost effective. It, it wasn't effective in helping lift people out of the situation they found themselves in. Um, but the legislature didn't think so either. Uh, they voted accordingly. They, they appropriated $10 million for emergency shelters, and we're utilizing that to the best of our ability. We want to set up something in Rutland. Um, we have the space available, uh, but we need someone to oversee it, um, and they're struggling with that as well. So, yeah, I think this model will work, uh, but we'll, we'll see. It may seem like it's underutilized right now, and that's, maybe that's a good thing. Um, but, um, but we'll see in time. Uh, we want to make sure that we fulfill basic health and safety needs of these families, making Governor, sure they have a place to go. Will there be any requirements for people in the shelter programs to take your workers up on their offers to, to seek uh, employment, to seek substance abuse counseling, uh, any sort of, if, if you get our help, you need to be working towards you're addressing your issues? Well, again, we want to make sure that we make them available. Uh, I'm not sure about making a, pri a, a priority, or maybe priority is not the best word, a requirement. Um, but we want to we want to help, and, and we think we can uh, by putting the right state folks in those shelters and checking in and, and interacting uh, with these families. I think that will give us the best result. I might uh, ask uh, Secretary Samuelson or uh, Commissioner Winters if either one of them wants to add to anything I've said or correct anything I've said. No, 
Governor, I think your response is spot on. Uh, when we think about the families that we are serving in the shelters, they are committed to moving forward and finding the next place that they want to be. And so we find that they, they with the services on site, um, with a diversity of services on site and with a team approach, so we are addressing their health care needs, um, we're addressing their economic needs, their workforce needs, that families are willing to engage and that e each of the families has a plan um, and supports for implementing that plan to move to self-sufficiency. And that's the value of having a shelter versus having uh, having a hotel room where individuals don't have access to those services in their space um, where they're not uh, engaged on a regular basis. And uh, Commissioner Winters, I wonder if you have anything to add there, but we really do find individuals and families are committed and they are engaged to finding and moving forward in, in permanent housing. Yeah, I think that's that's well covered. Thank you. And, you know, I would just add to the question earlier, like this is a model that could really be successful that we might want to build on when you have all of those services co-located in one site uh, and you're really able to help families move forward. Um, as far as the uptake in the shelters, that changes on an hourly basis. Um, the latest information we have is that this morning there are seven families now in Williston. Uh, so that shelter is full. We have two families in Waterbury and um, several others going through intake. Um, so we do expect quite a bit of use in these shelters and it'll be a great opportunity for us to see how we can really wrap those families in services and all of the things that they need and help them move forward to more permanent housing situations. Sorry to go back to the national stage, um, but um, I'm wondering how concerned you are about comments you've made about the president-elect affecting the incoming administration's posture as it relates to Vermont and how you go about forging relationships with key members of that administration in the coming months? Um, first of all, I'll, I'll probably know uh, some of the, those cabinet members um, in my interactions with other governors. I believe that there will be some governors. Uh, who will be part members of the, his cabinet uh, eventually, and I have good relationships with them. Um, I'm not going to be any different than I've been before. Uh, when I, I call call them like I see them, and uh, and I did that in the first four years of uh, the Trump administration, uh, and I'll continue to do that um, because I think it's important uh, that we have that. I'll do it in a respectful, civil way. I, res I respect the office of the president. I want to make that clear, regardless of who's there, um, because it's part of who we are, and we have to move on. So we were able to uh, work with the administration, his administration, previously. Um, there were some good things that he did uh, that we supported and uh, we advocated for, and they helped us in, uh, in ways as well. So. We'll see what happens. Um, I'm hoping that he will spend more time uh, trying to bring the country together uh, and trying to improve on some of our shortcomings um, and less time on retribution because that, that is just a waste of time. Uh, you now have an effective veto over any future yield bill. Uh, so what level of property tax increase would you accept? Do you have a number in mind, or what, what are you thinking about that? Well, uh, again, I will be putting out the December 1st letter uh, fairly soon. Uh, I'm not sure what that's going to say. Uh, but um, because we weren't able to come to agreement uh, in the last session, uh, I expect that there will be another increase in the December 1st letter. Uh, having said that, I do think that we need a bridge uh, to get us uh, to where we need to go, uh, but it has to come uh, coupled with structural changes. Some of the things that we talked about in the past and some new ones. We're going to learn a lot from the commission uh, that they uh, they put forth. Uh, so, and as well, uh, Interim Secretary Saunders has been on a listening and learning tour, and we've gleaned a lot from that. We've had 
superintendents uh, writing to us and with very, very thoughtful suggestions about what we could do uh, to, to um, provide education in a much more efficient way and effective way, cost effective way. So we'll take all of that together and we'll be putting that policy forward uh, and presenting it to the legislature in January. So um, I'm, um, I know we're, we're, we may have to buy down rates, we may have to do something in that respect, uh, but I know Vermonters can't afford uh, any more than they've already endured. What would buy down rates look like? Um, we'll have to, we'll see when, when we present our budget, uh, that'll become more clear. Uh, but, okay. but again, we want to protect Vermonters and uh, we've heard them loud and clear. And I hope the legislature has as well. I have to uh, just go to the phones, um, unless there was something specific followed up to that. No? Okay, we'll come back. Uh, Tim McQuiston, Vermont Business Magazine. Hi, Governor. Uh, speaking of uh, Secretary Saunders, are you going to nominate her again? Yes. Do that process? Yeah, I, I, uh, I, I commented on that, I think, a week or two ago. Yes. Okay. And if it doesn't work, would you go through the process of uh, naming her interim? Oh, I don't. I'm, I'm going to be more confident than that. I'm hoping that we can get her. I think she's she's proven herself time and time again. I think again, as I as I answered in, in one of the debates, uh, if if anyone spends 15 minutes with her, uh, they'll know she's the right person at this time to help lead us through this uh, extraordinary extraordinary uphill um, battle that we'll have in terms of trying to to uh, right size our education system. Uh, just a comment, Governor. I was driving down I-93 in Massachusetts a couple of weeks ago, and someone had tossed a cigarette butt into the median, and it caused a brush fire, and, and which wasn't a big deal as far as fires are concerned. But it, um, the traffic backup on both sides of the road they had to bring that apparatus from both sides. So even even a little thing like that uh, caused a, a pretty significant problem. You know, that, and that's all I got. Okay, well, again, the, the, the brush fires uh, that we're seeing, um, that's why we wanted to be sure that we're, we're communicating with Vermonters because I would have said uh, we had a lot of rain over the last couple of weeks and there shouldn't be any problem with, uh, with wildfires at that point. But, uh, but as they described, it's the underbrush and, and that is still very, very dry and we're in a drought condition. So I thought it was good that we uh, made sure that we communicated with Vermonters to, to tell them we're still at risk here. Uh, so just be careful. All right, Tom Davis, Compass Vermont. And just double checking. Sorry. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Tom. Uh, no questions today, thank you. And just double checking if Audra from the Newport Daily Express is on. Okay. All right, that's it. We can go back to the room. Oh, or not. Can I screw up? <laughs> 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 I didn't start this secretary a question. I'm sorry? Can I ask your ag secretary a question? Sure. Hanson, um, can you hear me? Oh, yeah. Hey, uh, could, could you just, just uh, talk about the role that migrant farm workers play in the state's agriculture sector? Well, thank you. Um, they play a very valuable role. Um, many have been here for many, many years. Um, they are incredible uh, supportive of um, dairy, produce, and other industries in Vermont. And this uh, Vermont is not alone uh, across the country. Uh, my colleagues in other states uh, rely on the on the workforce, um, and um, so it, it's a it's a situation that, of course, uh, we're watching and evaluating. And uh, if we need to react, we'll react. But I think uh, right now there's a lot of speculation going on, and we just need to maybe take a pause and 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 uh, you know monitor the situation and be ready if if we need to act. Um. I mean, do you have specific contingency plans in place at this stage? I do not. All right. 
Judge Michael Kanan in St. Jay recently told a New Hampshire resident in his court he was lucky he was being prosecuted in Vermont with our lenient bail laws. Uh, will you be recommending any specific bail reform? I'm sure we haven't developed all our policies at this point, but I think you can expect that we'll be back at it in the, um, the Judiciary Committee's uh, trying to hold people more accountable and making sure they show up for their arraignments and if they're charged and not the catch and release that we've seen in the past. Speaking of the legislature, um, the, the Senate and House Democratic caucuses in the next couple of weeks are going to be nominating their choices for leadership. Do you think there needs to be a, a change in leadership in the building after the selection? I think it's up to them. Um, obviously, uh, as I've said, they still have the majority in both the House and the Senate, and it's up to them to, to pick their leaders. And whoever they choose, um, I'm confident we can work with. Um, it will be a different dynamic, right? Without the, I mean, they were presented uh, over the last two years with an opportunity uh, to just push through anything that they wanted, knowing they had the votes to override my vetoes. And um, that wasn't the case in the first six years. So we were, and we were able to keep costs at bay and, and we didn't get everything we wanted. They didn't get everything they wanted, um, but we were at the table able to uh, able to at least negotiate some of that. So I look forward to getting back to the, the negotiating table at this point in time. If it was up to you, who would you rather work with as Speaker, Representative Sibelia or Representative Kruinsky? Um, I would, uh, somebody from the Republican Party. <laughs> That's who I'd like to, uh, to see as Speaker. How about in the in the Senate? Do you have anyone that you think would be particularly good at the Democrats? Same there, Republican on the Senate. Okay, side. but like in this problem of reality, <laughs> I, I can, we can work with whoever. It's their choice. Um, I'm not going to get involved in, in their politics, and I, I know that they'll. Maybe it's already been determined, but we'll work with whoever they choose. This past biennium, both the Speaker and the Pro Tem hailed from Burlington, and then in these down-ballot races, we saw Democrats lost a lot of rural seats. Do you think Democrats have a problem with rural Vermonters? I think um, we have obviously been identifying uh, the forgotten rural communities across the state, and, uh, and there's a rural caucus that I think should voice their concerns uh, of their constituents. I'd like to see uh, more more representatives, uh, more senators um, advocating for their constituents instead of their party. Um, with Representative Lamfer being uh, voted out, at least two of the four money chairs are now going to turn over this year. How do you think the budgeting process is going to look different as a result? Um, time will tell. I, I think that was, uh, again, remarkable in some respects when you think about the, the turnover, um, just the sheer turnover in both the House and the Senate. I mean, you have, I think there's over, going to be over 40 new representatives, new representatives and in the, uh, in the House and, uh, and nine, um, I don't know if, maybe nine in the, in the Senate. I mean, that's a, almost one third uh, of the bodies of uh, both the House and the Senate that are going to be new. So the dynamics are going to change. With uh, the chair of the Senate Natural Resources, think about the Senate Natural Resources in particular, lost three members mm -hmm. out of five. Mm -hmm. That's that's remarkable. Senate Finance too, lost a lot. Yeah, they had more members though. I think there's yeah. seven uh, in uh, Senate Finance, but mm -hmm. you know. Again, two left in yeah. Senate Natural Resources. Speaking of new, do you expect any new major appointments in your cabinet um, administration? We'll see. I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm sure that there will be some um, new appointments, people moving around, so time will tell. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.